Hi everybody. This Hi everybody. This is Joni Stahl. It's so good to be back here today again on what I refer to as the Koinonia Hour, which I only refer to that as when I have somebody on uh, that is sharing about the Lord. And I like to use the word koine because it is a Greek terminology of like just house fellowship, people getting together and it's real. And I like that. That's what I want the feel of the koine Koinonia hour to be. So as you see, I have someone here today that I'm excited to have on. Uh, his name is Fred Tomlinson. And uh, so I want to welcome you on, Fred. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank well, you. In case people don't know who you are, why don't you just for a few minutes, I don't know, just tell us anybody, everybody a little bit about yourself and. Okay. <clears throat> Well, my name is Fred Tomlinson. You know that much about me. And they tell me that my speech betrays me, that I'm really uh, from Liverpool, England, although I've lived in Canada for many years now. Um, I have been married for 57 years. And uh, we have four children, my wife and I, uh, together. Um, and they're, they're all going on with the Lord, which is a wonderful thing for us. And uh, they're all married and they have their own families. They've given us 16 grandchildren and we have 12 great grandchildren. And so that's a bit of background there. Um, I, uh, in my earlier life, I was a police officer in Liverpool, England. Uh, but the Lord had different plans for my life. I thought I'd found the career that uh, was tailor-made for me, and uh, I was settling in nicely to it. Um, but some things happened, and God spoke into my heart very clearly, and he spoke to my wife as well. And uh, I became involved in full-time Christian ministry in 1970. And... Uh, uh, I've been preaching ever since. Um, wo woven into my lengthy journey, um, the Lord has linked me with many people. I've referred to them often as doorkeepers, um, people who in a very significant way, perhaps sometimes unwittingly, have opened doors of opportunity for me, uh, which has helped steer me in many ways in respect to my ministry and my activities. Um, one, one such doorkeeper, just a couple of years ago now, uh, is the man who operates Sermon Index, uh, the Sermon Index website. And that continues to be something that's very significant and very important in my life. And it's through that particular door which was opened, I understand, uh, that the Lord linked me with uh, with a Lydia whose name is Joni Stahl. And that's how I'm here today. And uh, I'm very, very grateful to her. I'm very grateful for her openness to, to me. And I'm grateful that she's extended this invitation to me uh, to speak to you today. Well, that's, awesome. that. that's wonderful. Um, I have joined your fellowship, which I do enjoy so much and look so forward to. And um, but we'll talk about that at the end. And you could tell okay. everybody where to get a hold of you and everything will be all your information will be at the bottom in the description box. But okay. Okay. without further ado, um, I did ask you to come on to give us a lesson. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really looking forward to it. If you are ready, like I've been waiting <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm really excited. So if you are ready, Fred, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, I'm going to read some verses of scripture to start with. I'm going to read from the gospel according to Luke and from chapter seven. And I'll start my reading at verse 36. Um. And one of the Pharisees desired him, that is Jesus, of course, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. 
And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he uh, spoke within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, he would have known uh, what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, uh, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I, I suppose that he for whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, uh, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say to thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. What a wonderful, wonderful story that is uh, and has so much, I think, to teach us and help us with. Allow me just to perhaps stretch your imagination a little. Uh, imagine that you're watching um, um, a security camera in this rich man's house and uh, there's an event in progress at the time. He's, uh, he's invited a number of guests and there they are all participating in the conversation and whatever else. When, when quite suddenly an uninvited woman uh, enters the scene and she, you could say scandalously, marches straight in on this event. She's never been in this house before. Probably it was the very last place in the town she would ever have imagined going. But she, she marches into this house. She ignores everyone that's present and she goes directly to Jesus. But look a little more closely. Uh, the reference here that we find in verse 37 is that she was a sinner. Well, that really is a polite way of saying that she was a prostitute. Her life, I presume, was what today we might call a train wreck. Her world was moral darkness. Uh, she lost all her self-worth that had been shredded along the journey. She was, I think, in so many ways, the epitome of hopelessness. Um, almost universally um, rejected by people. And I believe it would be true to say that her, her mind was, it was tormented continually with demons. And, uh, you know, for someone listening to me today, that, that could very well be a familiar story because I have no idea who I'm speaking to this morning other than Joni. But this could very well be true of people that I'm talking to. Perhaps the details are not quite the same, but you can see as I've passed through those few remarks that 
there are features there that somehow resonate in, in your heart and somehow reflect some aspects of your own life. Let me just say a word about the, the, the domain of darkness. You know, there's a lot of mystery attached to this realm, no doubt, and certainly there are a lot of opinions one way and another. Um, but I want to say to you that demons are not all resident in witches' caverns, uh, nor are they merely on remote mission fields. I say that because I grew up in a Christian context and attended church and so on. We never saw any any evidence that I would recognize as been demonic going on, but we did listen to some of our returning missionaries at different times, and they would tell us of events that they faced on the mission field where there was no question they were they were dealing with demonic powers in very real ways. But you know, without me digressing too far here this morning, I, I believe that... Uh, that there are demonic forces and powers that are working, even in our Christian meetings. Um, I believe that there are many people who are professing Christians, but there are demonic powers working. I mean, this shouldn't sound terribly strange to you if you are a Bible reader, uh, because the Bible tells us plainly that um, as Christian people, we're facing the adversity of sinister demonic powers. Paul goes to length to describe these things, or goes into a degree of detail, at least I should say, in Ephesians. Um, but the fact is, there is an enemy who is going about, says another apostle, uh, seeking who he can devour. He, in other words, he's seeking to bring ruin into men and women's lives and to shred the testimony of those who profess to be Christians, if, if you can. Uh, there's no question about that. <clears throat> and uh, I personally have met many such people in the journey of my life and in the course of my own ministry. And uh, um, I could talk about that very easily, but I, I'll resist that on this occasion. But the fact is there are, there are many doorways and there are many pathways through which those dark powers find an opportunity to influence uh, men and women's lives. And I'm speaking about people in many, because I'm mean, speaking in a Christian context, people who would profess to be Christian people. Uh, but the fact that you're a Christian does not in any way make us immune from demonic attack and the interference of these dark powers. Some of you I'm talking to know very well what I'm talking about, I'm sure. But there are many different doorways, as I say, through which these powers uh, find access to our lives and different pathways, different journeys that we may be on uh, and events that are unfolding, which in one way or another uh, provide opportunities for these enemies to gain an access and an influence over our lives. I could make some kind of list. It wouldn't be an exhaustive list, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it just a couple of statements. I, I believe that uh, every kind of unclean activity in which men and women engage, and, and once again, I won't say it again, but I'm reminding you that I'm talking to people who in many cases are calling themselves Christians. Uh, we can engage in, in immoral activities by simply watching what you're seeing on screens these days, which is completely immoral and demonic, and there are powers that are working behind these things and through these things, again, seeking to um, have influence and, and fulfill their own mission in the lives of people. Uh, but it's not, it's not only immoral activities. I, I just mentioned one other area which is quite different on the surface of things, and that is false teaching. But false teaching uh, heard and received and embraced can, uh, in many cases, give an opportunity for the enemy to get a foothold in people's lives. And uh, I, I've, I've often said in speaking about these things that, uh, that there, there are consequences from our actions. And I'm thinking, you know, if, if you put your hand into a burning fire, you're going to get burned. Uh, if you jump into a, into a swimming pool, you're going to get wet. 
And rest assured that if you open the door, uh, or, or I'm thinking of a verse from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, if you break the hedge, the barrier, a serpent will bite you, that verse of scripture says. In other words, if we engage in certain things, there are consequences, and sometimes those consequences are very, very serious indeed. And so this, this is a fact. And when I read about this woman in this section of scripture, I, I put, it, it, you can say it's my opinion, but uh, I, I believe that uh, she would have most certainly opened herself up to these kinds of dark powers uh, and to him who, whose intent is to steal and to kill and to destroy. Amen. Now, coming back to this passage of scripture, I think it would be true to say many would claim uh, that this woman who comes, as I've put it already, scandalously walking into this house, uh, has um, somehow heard about Jesus. And uh, I, I don't doubt that for a moment. But I'd like to suggest to you that there was far more involved than merely hearing about him. She likely had heard about him. Uh, but I watch the way, <clears throat> excuse me, the way she comes into this house and there's, there's just nothing random about her manner as she comes into this house. She is decisive. Uh, I've suggested to you that there were other people there in the room because uh, the scripture speaks about this woman as someone who was not invited. But that suggests to me that there were other people there who were invited. And uh, But she comes in again. She's not random. She's decisive. Uh, she knows exactly what she's there for. She knows exactly who she's looking for. And, uh, but, you know, let's just re rewind the camera just a little bit for a moment, as it were. I mean, her, her entrance is, is bold. Her entrance is shameless. Uh, she, she, she comes in, she, what she is intent upon doing I mean, I can't tell you all the thoughts that went through her mind, but she definitely had some thoughts because she's in possession of something that she's brought with her into this room. She is on a mission. Uh, all this tells me that there had to have been a previous event that took place between the man that she's coming in to see and her own life. And this is why she's there. Uh, something led to this that's taking place here. Uh, she had indeed heard him. She had seen him. Uh, the Apostle John writing in his epistle, if I may digress just for a moment, he, he speaks about his own privilege in having seen the incarnated Son of God. And in the opening verses of that first epistle of John, he says, we've seen him and we have gazed upon him. And I believe, I believe that's exactly what this woman had done. She'd, she'd heard about him. She would found herself in the company where he was talking to other people or a crowd of people. She'd seen him with her eyes. I do believe I'm right to say she gazed upon him. And the fact of the matter is that as she did that, she recognized quickly uh, that he was unlike any man that she had ever met in her life. Again, I, I do a lot of this. You hope you'll excuse me. Digressing here and there as we walk along this pathway. Uh, I'm not daisy picking as we go along, but I'm looking for something that perhaps just supports what I'm saying. I'm thinking just now of what I read in John's Gospel in chapter 4. And... It's, it's the story of the, another woman, the woman at the well, as we often think of that section of scripture. And she had met with Jesus. And I'm not going to digress enough to tell you all that went on. Uh, but there's one verse that stands out in my mind. It comes back to me just now as I'm speaking to you. Because uh, she obviously had a very similar lifestyle to the woman that we're looking at. And it says in the text in John that she went back to the men and said, come and see a man who told me all things that ever I did. In other words, she had met a man that was unlike any of the men that she knew in her life. And the exact same thing is true here. I'm certain of it. 
uh, that when she looked at Jesus, when she listened to him, as she gazed upon him, she recognized that this man was from a, he was from another universe to the universe she lived in. And I think I could safely say that she'd been captivated by him as she gazed upon him and she heard his voice and his voice was like the balm of Gilead to her. The raging storm in her mind somehow ceased as she gazed upon him and listened to his words. His words seemed to unlock that steel-like door of her heart. Never man spake as this man. I dare say that as she stood there in a the crowd, she was oblivious to those that are standing around her. I, I believe it would be true to say that she felt as though she was standing there in the sing, uh, alone in the very presence of this man, this man Jesus. We've often heard that even in our own meetings, that there'll be someone come in and they will say, I, I felt as though you, you were looking into my soul or I felt as though you were speaking directly to me. I'm certain that's exactly what was going on here on this occasion. What this woman could not possibly have known was that she, in all of the mess and chaos of her life, was one of his sheep. He was a shepherd. He was the shepherd. And she heard the shepherd's voice. Do you remember? We read about that in John chapter 10. She heard his voice. And, and I believe, stay with me a moment, I believe she ran to him. Oh, no, I don't mean physically. But I, I believe in her heart. On that occasion, she, she, she heard his voice. And, 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 and everything about him, his manner, his person, his, his, his cleanness, his purity seemed to embrace her. He was loving her, even as she stood there, probably many, many feet away from her, but she felt as though she was being embraced by him. His sheer presence translated her somehow into heaven. Amen. And I believe it's this that explains the behavior that we're seeing in the Pharisee's house. You know, Charles Wesley, a great hymn writer of yesteryear, he wrote these words in reference to Jesus, and they fit right in here. He speaks, and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful, broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. That's exactly what was taking place here. What's all this saying to us today? Well, notice, notice this. I'm looking back into 30, verse 38 where I read, uh, and she stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head uh, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Amen. What does that say to us? In the light of all of these things that I'm sharing here, I believe it tells us this, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe today that uh, he still beams light into dark prison cells. He still speaks and dead souls wake. He still causes chains of bondage to fall and crash, as it were, to the floor. He still causes those prison doors to fly open. He still sets prisoners free. He still makes wounded prisoners, uh, wounded spirits, should I say, whole. He still takes the vile and makes them holy. Glory to God. He is still the same yesterday, today and forever. And this woman, as she responds, she worshipped him. And can I say this? She worshipped him in the beauty of holiness. Um, she gave to the Lord 
the glory due to his name. Look more closely at her worship and, and, and weigh what we see here against so many of the modern trends which we call worship. <clears throat> this didn't involve a band. Uh, there was no human leader. There was no special prayer. Uh, she never uttered a word. At least there's no word recorded here in this passage at all. Her worship was an action, an action which was a response. It was a response to his, uh, how, how can I describe it? Because her knowledge was limited concerning him at this point, but it was a response to his holy uh, set apartness. He was just, he was different. He was distinct. He was utterly distinct and utterly different. And what that, that distinctiveness about his, some, his identity, she found to be so appealingly attractive to her. She loved it. She wanted it. She wanted to know him. And so she responds. And it's all about him. It's not about herself. Um, it was utterly and completely self-effacing. I mean, she, di she didn't even sing, uh, you know, here I come to worship. If, if you understand what I'm saying, she didn't, it wasn't about her or what she was doing. She wasn't thinking, well, I am now worshipping. She was spontaneously responding to what she had seen, what she had experienced, and the impact that all this was making upon her life and upon her very soul. Amen. Even the word worship in the Hebrew, it means to bow down. And, and, and that's exactly what we see here. She comes behind him. I love this scene. It's so it's 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 so wonderful as my imagination plays on these words. Again, she comes straight into the room. She comes straight to Jesus. This is who she's here for. She couldn't care less, as it were, about the, the, the owner of the house, the rich Pharisee, or all of his people or attendants. There, she goes to him. She's got something she must do. She's constrained inwardly with passion passion for this man that she honours and respects. She doesn't know very much about him, really, I don't think at all. Uh, I don't think any of the people in those days knew very much about him, really. But the fact is, she knows that the most appropriate thing that she can do is fall at his feet. And I won't go through the particulars that I've read to you twice now that she did, but but she, 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 she is so passionate as she comes to him in, in this way. She's not caring about her reputation or what anyone's thinking about her there. She's not concerned uh, about how she's dressed uh, appropriately or otherwise. That's a, not a consideration for at this point in time. She's not concerned that she's uh, the intrusion that she is engaged in coming into this house in such a scandalous way. And she's not considering the cost somewhere. I don't know where she got the box of alabaster ointment from. And there's all kinds of guesses as to the value. of We don't know the value of it. But I, I can say this. I believe that it was the it, it was the most expensive thing that she possessed. And she felt the most appropriate thing was to just spill it on this wonderful man as she did. And that constituted her worship. And I'd like to ask you, are you a worshipper? You know, in John's Gospel, chapter 4, again, I, I hear these words that the Father seeking such to worship, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not a performance. It's not an entertainment. It's not, it's not a, a, a nice thing to do that we enjoy doing. And uh, No, no, no. True worship is always a response to a revelation of God that he opens to us. And that's what's taking place here. Whatever you do, don't make the same mistake that the Pharisee made on this occasion, recorded in the 39th verse. Uh, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he, he spoke within himself. He didn't speak out loud. This is what he was thinking, in other words. Uh, if this man was a prophet, he'd know what kind of a woman this is. This is a disgrace. 
Uh, it's interesting that the next verse says, and Jesus answered him. Well, we just said he didn't say a word. Well, that's because Jesus reads our thoughts. And he knew exactly what Simon was thinking. And he responds to it, as we have seen, uh, and so on. Um, but he made a terrible mistake at that point in time. And uh, he's just a religious spectator. We have a lot of those in these days. Um, but, uh, you know, before, before we leave this woman, let's just glance back at her just one more time. Consider what she found. She found in those moments a closeness to Jesus. She found in those moments that she was drinking of that clear stream of water, that clear water, beloved, that flows down the golden street in heaven. She tasted the life of God flowing through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, 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 and she just knew she was accepted by him. There's, that clearly, there was never a thought that he would reject her or re renounce her or tell her to get out of the... Not at all. She was the most important person there to Jesus as she responded in this particular way. She was accepted by him. And there's a sense in which she'd just come home. It had nothing to do with the Pharisee's house or how rich it was or anything. But she'd come home. She'd come home to him. And everything about him resonated in her heart. And she knew that she knew that she had found truth. She'd found life. And she'd found freedom uh, for herself. Wonderful. And, and how right she was when she thought he would not reject her. Indeed. Amen. And Jesus tells her that that her love, this act of devotion, this act of worship, was counted by God to her as faith. Your faith, uh, uh, Jesus said, was the uh, means of her sins being forgiven. Amen. And before it's all through, he says to her, just go in peace. I'd love to have seen that moment, wouldn't you? He was embracing her. I, I mean, figuratively, I don't know what else happened. She, he was loving her and he said, just go in peace, sister. You're free. And that day she left the prison house of demons and she skipped. She skipped into the father's house that day. Hallelujah. You know, as I read on the first three verses of chapter eight, I won't do that. You might want to do it. Uh, we're introduced to several women there. And there's a bit of a debate. Could it, could it be that the woman in chapter 7, this unnamed woman in chapter 7, was in fact Mary, who is known as Mary Magdalene, uh, from, from whom um, these uh, e e evil spirits had been cast from her? Um, it's only my opinion, but I think it was. But it doesn't matter. That's exactly what happened to the unnamed woman in chapter 7. No doubt about that at all. Amen. What's the takeaway from my talk with you? Well, I think it reminds, it reminds me, and I hope it reminds you, of the utter preciousness of Jesus. Uh, it reminds us that his mission remains undiminished today. It reminds me that he's still taking people out of horrible pits and out of miry clay. He's still setting their feet upon a solid rock. He's still putting a song in the mouths of men and women. I think it also reminds me of the, 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 the profundity of the response of this woman on this occasion. She heard him call her name, as it were, and she ran to him. And she ran to him in, in an utter abandon, uh, as I've sought to describe to you this morning. And uh, it could be, it could be he's calling your name 
this morning or whenever afternoon or whenever it is you listen to this, it could be he's calling your name. And I invite you to consider that very seriously. I know nothing about your circumstances. I know nothing about you at all. But it could be that the Spirit of God has ordained this moment to speak a word into your heart. And it could be that he's calling you. Perhaps you've never responded to him ever before. And this would be then the first time in your life that you really come and lay your life before him and accept him as your Lord and your Saviour. And I encourage you to consider doing that very seriously. It could be for others that you've been living with issues in your life while professing to be Christian, but you know that things are not as they ought to be and you're not experiencing that closeness. And perhaps you would say, confess, well, I don't know anything about that kind of abandoned worship to him. And I encourage you, if you sense he's speaking to you, it's because he's calling you to a fresh response to him. And uh, I encourage you, as you get an opportunity to get alone with God quietly, and open your heart up to him. He'll continue to speak to you and allow him to come and bring deliverance. Allow him to bring cleansing to your heart. Allow him to make you new. And he will say to you, he won't be chasing you away. He didn't chase this woman away, but he'll say, just go in peace. She, she, didn't, she didn't leave the way she entered the house, did she? She was a transformed woman, I believe that. She would never be the same ever again. Whatever had happened was she watched him outside. That interaction with him in that room was, <clears throat> was holy. Amen. How are you doing? My voice is gone. You know, um, I really feel the <clears throat> in that, Fred, because there are so many people that watch this, and I hear from so many they are so discouraged. They are Christians and they are so discouraged. I hear from many that have been Christians for decades and they say, they still say, it's like an echo I hear and it can come from all over the, the world. I hear from people and it's collective, but it's the same. Uh, I don't know how to get near to Christ. Um, they, they, um, they fall into a trap or in a trap of some kind where they say, I, I hear that, but there's something in me that feels like I'm just like, they're, they're like, they want to make God happy, but they feel they're not able to make God happy. And they're always so hungry for Christ. What, what would you tell these people that are like, I want him, but there's something in me. I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like, how do I get him and I know your words are just so all encompassing and they're echoing in my own spirit right now. I feel the uh, witness bearer bearing witness to my spirit, and uh, but there are people that want him so desperately. Uh, <clears throat> what would you say to them? And, and just let me add this one part. And there are people that have written to me, like I said, all from all over the world, different nations. And they are very, they're in very difficult situations religiously in religious environments. I, I'm just going to stop right there. And how you want to answer that, I'll just leave it up to you. Mm -hmm. What would you say to Thank them? <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I said something in the course of speaking before, which um, I believe to be biblically sound. Uh, and I, I believe I can support that very definitely. But perhaps. Perhaps you've not thought of it this way yourself. I, I suggested to you that that woman unknowingly was one of his sheep. You see, the Bible tells us that he's chosen us before the foundation of the world. And uh, th this is a remarkable truth. And it's difficult for us to get our minds around. But the fact is this, that he's not chosen any of us because we're good. He's not chosen any of us because we've lived moral lives, uh, etc. And and because that true that is true, if we turn that over upside down, as it were, then that tells me. I found I find this that in that he didn't choose me for being good or because I was good. He's not going to reject me because I'm bad. If, if his heart is toward you, whoever you are and you have a desire to know him, 
rest assured this is a work of the Holy Spirit that is put in your heart. If you read in, in the book of Romans, you'll hear Paul saying uh, that there are none who naturally seek the Lord. And there's a lot more uh, to be said about that. Uh, so insofar as anyone finds a desire to know God, you can rest assured no matter what your life's about or whatever you, your life represents, he, he's calling you. This is the Holy Spirit awaking you to his truth and to his love and to the gospel. And uh, any suggestion that you're not good enough or, or you, you're, you're missing the mark somewhere, accept that as one of those works of those dark powers I referred to that are seeking to distract you and, 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 and cause you to become discouraged and turn away. But the voice of the shepherd is always a voice of, of invitation. It's calling. It, it, it resonates something in your heart resonates with it. You may say, well, I don't know how this is going to happen, but that's not the issue. You know, you remember when uh, the angel spoke to Mary of old, you remember the setting, and he told her what was going to happen to her. And, uh, and her response was, how can this be since I know not a man? In other words, what the angel was saying uh, didn't make sense to her. It was unreasonable in the extreme. And, and he responded by saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And, and, and really, that's, I can stop, put a period after that statement, uh, because the Lord was going to do something which would be miraculous that she had no ability whatsoever to do. She couldn't just sort of try to believe and somehow that the Christ child would be formed in her womb. That, that wouldn't happen. This was an act of God. Uh, she needed just to believe his word. Uh, she said, I, I don't know how this is going to happen, but be it unto me according to your word. She surrendered himself to him. And I encourage you, whoever you are that perhaps are in this category that uh, uh, Joni has mentioned, um, deliberately refuse the, the, the lies and suggestions that somehow you're discounted because you are not. The fact that you are now under the sound of the word of God tells you that the spirit of God is working upon you. And as you simply bring your life to complete submission before him and unto him, he will do or he will begin a work in your life that will bring complete transformation to you. Amen. Yeah, that's really good. You know, that really stuck out to me in this talk that you had about, I never thought of it that way before, Fred, how you talked about Jesus. You know, we all refer to him as that great shepherd of the sheep. And you know how it just kind of remains on some kind of thin surface, right? Mm. But he has a voice that calls. Mm. And when I never heard it that way, and it was that's revolutionary for me mm. because I love to refer to him as the shepherd. So for me, mm. I take away from that, even for myself, even for mm. somebody who's, and I'm mm. no, in no way attained anything. I'm just saying it was a gem for me mm. because. I think that we think of a one shot deal that, oh, he has, he has called me once. And then that's it. And I and, and I don't know what's happening now. That's right. Like that shepherd, like you said, she was one of his sheep mm. and she was responding. Mm. And this other world power that's in right. the natural world. And she maybe, like you said, didn't understand mm. it. But um, I like mm. to say, because you, you talked about seeing, you talked about hearing. And to me, I always say it's all about seeing. You know, um, you know, it says in uh, John 640, it says, for this is the will. Jesus says this. This is the will of him that sent me. That every one that seeth the son of God and believeth on his name mm -hmm. shall have everlasting life. And I will raise him again at the last day. That's right. Understand it's spiritual. So you were saying like she was mm -hmm. seeing and hearing even in an unregenerate state. Mm -hmm. That's, that's powerful to me. That's right. Because uh, you know how Paul says in, in Romans chapter 10, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And, and it's, it's, the, uh, it's the rhema of God there for those who are interested. It's the personal word. In other words, it's that moment which could be happening this morning for many people where they hear God speaking uh, through our voices maybe, but in their heart, 
Um, you know, and, and I couple this tightly with seeing, as you're saying, uh, we have an expression in England, you know, that such and such happens and then the penny drops, we say, you know, or the light comes on. And, and I, I think for this woman, she was living a life, she was engaged in all of these immoral activities and whatever else we don't know. But the fact is, when she faced Jesus, it's as though the light went on. Some, in, inwardly, she wasn't just outwardly seeing him, she did that, but inwardly a light went on inside. And, and I believe as he spoke, she was hearing the rhema of God to her heart and faith was being quickened and a miracle was taking place in her heart at that very moment. And, uh, and we believe also, of course, in the context of the new covenant message that um, when, when this is true for us, we actually receive his life into our hearts. It, 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 he, he, he speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. Amen. Amen. That's yes. such a great word. I just thank you so much. You know, I could go on for like, you know, another several hours of this because I, I know a lot of people that wa are going to watch this and mm. are watching this could say they the same thing. And um, I just can't thank you enough for bringing that word. <clears throat> I mean, it really ministered to me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's always going the deeper and deeper with That's Christ. Right. That's right. You, you had said something in one of your uh, messages I had listened to about wanting more of Christ. And um, I don't know. I mean, I know there probably, I don't know how much time you have and you'll have to go through the whole thing. But I listened to one of your messages and you were talking about how you, you know, that you were a person that was raised in a Christian home, that you were always in the word. Um when you grow up to, you know, it gotten older and older and you had gone that way, be, you know, you never smoke, you didn't drink, you didn't have a desire for any of those things. You wanted God, but you talked about something that was so profound to me. And I love that story so much is when you went to that old house, <laughs> you have like a minute just to kind of tell everybody that, because I think everybody would love to hear if, if you, if you have the time, if not, you can come back another time and tell that story. But I love that so much. I just, I replayed it like three times. <laughs> so I it. Yeah. Well, there's all, there's all kinds of um, resistance. It comes in many different forms in, in our individual lives. And okay, I didn't get involved in many of those activities you refer to, but that's not to suggest that my life was perfect by any means at all. But th that's the environment in which I was raised. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but 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 I, I suffered from a, another resistance, another kind of resistance, and that was I, I just I just believed that whatever I was believing and what I'd experienced, that was it. It was a done deal, in other words. And so when when I had someone speaking to me and which was my brother, as a matter of fact, and telling me that there was something more than I'd experienced. And this wasn't just some kind of charismania thing, but he was telling me there was something more. And, and, and I, I resisted it. I, I resisted my brother so much he was in tears. And this wasn't just one occasion. And uh, I'll just tell you this one incident. I won't go into lots of detail here, except for this. Um, uh, he, he he had moved outside of the sort of boundary of our assemblies and he'd gone to a house meeting that was nothing to do with the group of assemblies that we were part of. And and, and we didn't do those kinds of things back then. And uh, But he'd found this something uh, that he was telling me about. And uh, he'd, he'd already, uh, my father, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a bit here, I don't wish to. Uh, my father was dying at this point, point in time, and my father was very concerned uh, with what was happening to my brother. And he said to my mother, he said, that these, these, he's lying on his deathbed almost. He said, these are not those second blessing people that Dave's got mixed up with, are they? And my mother told me this story later. She said, I said to him, she said, I don't know who they are. But she said, Fred, that was his name also. She said, Fred, whatever's happened to Dave is good. And uh, so when my father passed away, she started going to these meetings. 
one of my wife Sheila's sisters started going to these meetings. They were sort of ganging up around me. And so on this particular occasion, I, I, um, I was just being the taxi driver, driving my brother and my sister-in-law to this house. There was no meeting on that night, but there would be some people there. And uh, when we arrived there, of course, my plan was they get out, I, the door closes and I go home. But um, my brother said, Dave, uh, Fred, why don't you come in? Just come in, just say hello to these people. And I said, no, I'm not interested. And my sister-in-law, she said, Fred, I don't believe you. She said, you, what are you afraid of? She said, you're a policeman. She said, what, like, what's going to happen to you? Uh, and she shamed me. And so I agreed to go in. And that's all I need to say about that. I went in. That wasn't the night when everything happened. But but in the course of talking with some people there, I, I, I saw a, a, a degree of purity in one particular young man that was there. I just knew these people had something I didn't have. And that was rocking all my, my, my sort of security that I was finding in believing that what I had was all there was to it. I'd prayed the prayer and I'd read my Bible and, and attended hundreds and hundreds of meetings. Um, but when I went home, uh, my wife knew where I'd been and she guessed what had happened. That, you know, I was longer than I would have been just dropping them off and she said what happened and uh, I remember saying to her and she remembers it even more vividly than me but uh, I said I've never seen I've never seen love like that Sheila and my, my wife would say at that point no marriage wasn't in shreds or anything uh, not at all but she said she felt just in her heart at that moment that this whatever this was this was going to be the answer for our lives how right she was. And we agreed to go to a meeting and that was a massive thing, climbing up the steps into that old house on that second occasion was a scary experience. And, uh, but in that meeting, I, I heard God speak to me and uh, I won't go into lots more details, I'll be taking a lot more time. But, but that, that was a turning point in my entire life. My entire life, I look back, that was 1966. That was a long time ago. And, uh, and it impacted the entirety of my life. I'm here talking to you today because the Lord engineered that. And I, I wanted to say that about this woman as well. The Lord engineered that moment to get that woman in that place at that time so he could say those things that she would hear and she would respond in that way. And that's exactly what he's doing to people today, I believe. He's, he's engineered a moment. We can think, well, I, I'm only here because, well, that's what we do or whatever at this time. But believe it, that if God is seeking to do something in your life, he'll get you to the right place. He'll get you to the right place at the right time to meet the right people so you can hear the right word to your heart and it'll be a word of deliverance to you. <clears throat> Amen. I, I believe that video is today for a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are going to hear this, and I know that they're going to be blessed by it because I feel the mark of the Holy Spirit on it. I really do. I do feel, and I don't just say that loosely. I'm not that kind of a person. I do feel his presence, and I do bear witness because he's bearing witness to my spirit, you know. And um, I just want to thank you so much. And um, I don't want it to. I don't want to have too much talk after this because I want the message that you gave. Okay. I want it okay. to how Jesus says, "Let these words sink into your ears." Right. I want it to sink into them. So, so before we go, um, I do want to so thank you so much for taking your time. It was a great honor and a privilege to have you on. I hope that you would want to come on again and thank you. from time to time. <laughs> Thank you. And that some more lessons. And, you, and we do have a website you wanted me to mention at the end. Yeah. People are going to want to know how they can find you. So, and remember everything that you say to them. I want everybody to know it'll be in the description box, but please tell them how they can find you. Okay. Well, our fellowship address is mackenziefellowship.com. It's as simple as that. Uh, I had someone write yesterday uh, on on. A, a comment on one of the messages and it said I've searched and searched for McKendley Fellowship well you won't find it. it's McKenzie MCK McKenzie Fellowship.com and uh, and of course as you know 
uh, were on sermon index and whatnot. And all from the strange environment of my study. <laughs> and also to your website. Um, they can write to you, right? Like if they want to, because I remember I wrote and I was like, hey, I'm yeah. over here. <laughs> yeah, certainly. There's another brother who uh, who looks after that and he hosts a, a Skype meeting on Sunday at 10.30 Pacific time, uh, US. Um, and if you want to go to that, you're welcome. It's just a small affair. But um, so if you write through our address, uh, through, through the uh, website, you'll link with Peter and he corresponds with me regularly. And that's how it all works. So God bless you, Joni, and God bless everyone that's listening. Thank and you. God right. bless you. Bye-bye.